Welcome to our YouTube channel. We're so glad that you found us. Please enjoy this inspiring interview with Keith Kavanaugh, where he was interviewed by Julie Butler and Anja Jansen. You can find out more about Keith at his website, acimwithkeith.com. For more information on our non-dual community and the free resources we provide, we invite you to visit our website at awakening-together.org. We hope you enjoy the satsang and hope to see you live in the sanctuary. Thank you, Rhoda, and lovely to be here with everyone. Welcome to Awakening Together. Um, so Keith, and a very warm welcome to you, Anya and I, um, who'll be interviewing you, are so excited and really looking forward to having these 90 minutes with you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'll just say quickly, I don't know, um, Rhoda may have already said, but Awakening Together is a, um, is a worldwide online spiritual community based on non-dual teachings. Um, so it fits in a lot with um, what you're doing, Keith, which is um, very much um, taking a non-dual approach in, in the way that you explain a, way, um, a Course in Miracles. So I'll just read a quick biography for Keith. Um, Keith first heard A Course in Miracles 30 years ago in a talk by Wayne Dyer where the course was quoted and he has been reading it ever since. Life took a turn just over a decade ago when a crippling generalised anxiety disorder took hold of Keith's life for about eight years, effectively reducing it to a half-life, and it culminated in a rock-bottom point of readiness to devote himself to the course in earnest. Um, did you want to say something, Keith? No? That all sounds um, very accurate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a common story, isn't it, that um, reaching a rock-bottom point but going on through his devoted practice, the generalized anxiety disorder disappeared and he started having awakening and oneness experiences. And he was asked to share his experiences in, in various podcast talks, one of which I heard, which was the Miracle Voices podcast. And from there, um, largely by popular demand, he um, for more teachings, he started up the uh, Course in Miracles with Keith Facebook group and does regular Zoom meetings, uh, which are on his YouTube channel and also a podcast. And he also does private mentoring now. Um, so what he does say on his Facebook group is that um, it's open to anyone, um, but, but it does discuss the practical applications um, of a Course in Miracles based on the teachings of Ken Wapnick. Um, we also look at what Ken taught, um, how what Ken taught brings the Course into alignment with many other spiritual paths and teachings. So Keith, that's a rough outline, but what do you feel to share with us about in terms of the story of Keith so far and what's brought you to this point? Just whatever you feel to share with us, we'd love to hear. Sure. Um, I've always been passionate about spirituality. And so, and that goes back to when I was a teenager. Um, and I would read about world religions and psychology and um and various different spiritual approaches and psychic abilities and past lives. And so from the time I was like 12, 13, that was that was my passion. Um it, it was, I think, I mean, it was my passion because there were moments in life where I would have said I could feel God's presence. Um, now I would say it was the presence of the Holy Spirit or it was presence. Um, but I would have said back then that there were just times in nature or there were times, you know, watching perhaps a story on the triumph of the human spirit or uh, reading a, a, a sacred text of some description where it was a little bit like the clouds would part and there was this presence that was there. And I knew it was the most important thing in the world. And I feel like I spent my, my teenage years and my 20s um, really in some ways frustrated, but trying to chase down that presence in my mind, how to how to hold it and not lose it. Um, and so and so that would have been my my big, big passion. But jumping ahead a little bit of time, um, there was. Yeah, I, I read the course, first of all, 30 years ago, Wayne Dyer spoke about it on in a course. I loved the quote that he gave, which was, if you knew who walked with you on the way that you've chosen, you could never know fear again. 
Um, and I thought I've got to read that book. <laughs> so I did and didn't understand most of it <laughs> and was frustrated and threw it against the wall on quite a few occasions. Um, however, I kept dipping into it over, over the years. Um, I, I was not great at forgiveness. Um, this particular body mind is a Scorpio and that's not our strong suit at all. <laughs> and so every time, I mean, I, like I, I loved the course. I, I did not practice forgiveness with any kind of, um, um, enthusiasm whatsoever. Every time a forgiveness opportunity came up, I sort of thought God has no right to ask me to give that. Um, I didn't understand forgiveness. I didn't understand the Course in Miracles. Um, then just about, I don't know, 12 years ago, there was a situation where life took a turn and there was a perfect storm of health problems, conflict at work, conflict at home. Um, and and it just culminated in me sort of like plunging into a generalized anxiety disorder that was to last eight years. Um, and it was pretty intense and pretty awful. Um, and it took me a year even to believe it was anxiety because it was so physical. Um, so I paid a fortune for brain scans and heart scans and overall tests and everything because I just couldn't believe that anxiety would be such a physical experience, but it was. And I had it from the minute I got up in the morning and until I went to bed at nighttime and it, I couldn't sit still for a minute or it felt like I would explode. I had to keep shaking my leg. The heart palpitations was probably the worst thing. Um, that was my fixation, uh, was the heart palpitations. And, and so even at nighttime, I had to learn how to fall asleep, shaking my leg and digging my fist into my solar plexus to try and take my attention off the, the sort of skipping heartbeats with the anxiety. Um, so enough said, anyone who's ever had anxiety knows how, how awful it is. Um, but it, but I did reach a point around about, cause I had no sense of God's presence in my mind for eight years it it became like a desert and it became life was just simply survival and it was just getting the day out of the way as best i could um and and there was a constant sense the whole way through that sort of the opportunity for spiritual development had completely passed me by and i may never get it back <clears throat> but after about um eight years i did reach a rock bottom point of readiness to say there must be a better way and and I knew the course was the way. And I plunged myself into Kenneth Wapnick's books and lectures and teachings. And I no longer listened to music in the gym. I listened to Ken Wapnick lectures <laughs> and commuting and everything else. And and there was just one technique that Ken really, you know, sort of drove home. And it was this idea that he called being in the cinema with Jesus. Um, now, if anyone Anyone, and I know most of you are familiar with A Course in Miracles, and it's it's not saying anything different than what's meant by the metaphor of being above the battleground with Jesus. But it's to say that you would take on the position of the observer in your mind or the witness. And and it was it was really like you were watching the world and watching your mind and emotions um, as an observer as someone who's in the audience. So there was this idea that you connect with a presence of perfect love in your mind that Jesus is a symbol for, um, and then that you would look at your ego without judging it. And there was a practice I did regularly, which was just simply allowing the anxiety to be there. So I understood from how Ken taught the course that you don't fight the darkness. And so there was this practice of allowing the anxiety to be there without resistance to it and without judging it. And, and so I would regularly just say, yes, there's anxiety in my wrong mind, but what does that have to do with the me that's in my mind with Jesus? Um, and between those two practices, after about, after about two months, I remember turning to my husband and saying, my anxiety is getting better. And I, it, it was the strangest thing. It, it was like there was suddenly there was a silence in the back of my mind, which had for eight years, there was nothing but madness and chaos and doom. And, and it was nonstop. Like there was never silence in my mind. And suddenly there was a silence there. 
And it was there even when I was having conversations or when I was getting on with other things, there was this silence I was aware of in the back of my mind, which I would have said was the Holy Spirit. And after about another two months, um, the anxiety was gone. And the way it felt was that the silence, the stillness in my mind sort of just took back territory from, from the anxiety. And, and then there was some weird things happened um, where I, so the, I mean, the, the, the peace that was there started to feel like love on occasion, which was like really beautiful and overwhelming. And I hadn't sort of been prepared for that. And there was, this, ter this this enormous gratitude. And then there was situations where in life I would start, I would see something. You know, the first time it happened was in a restaurant when I opened a butter wrapper and suddenly the butter was love. Now my eyes were still looking at butter, but in my mind I was like, that's love. And it is, I, I've been wrong about everything I ever thought or believed in life because this love is the only thing that was ever happening anywhere. And 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 the, the strange thing was that I wasn't separate from it. Um, I, I was inseparable from that love that was the only thing that was real. And, and that would happen with different things. <laughs> um, in some ways, it's odd in the sense that it was things it happened with first rather than people, the sense of um, oneness, the sense of non-separateness. Uh, the, the people thing was to come much later. Um, and so I guess that's my story. That was, um, the, the, there was an awakening took place. Um, it, it, in, in time, I came to realize that the peace in my mind was, was what's real, what's here now in this moment, and that it's the truth of everything and everyone. And and from that space, I was able to see that Keith was just a self that was made out of thoughts and that there was no actual identity there. Um, and, and really, ever since then, my spiritual path is really being vigilant for the times when I dissociate what I know is here now in this moment and is the truth of everything. Uh, I'll dissociate that and rise as a separate self made out of stories on whose behalf some form of micro suffering will arise like um, impatience or irritation or affront. And and really, I just have it down to a fine art that the instant the micro suffering happens, I would realize I've gone insane again, <laughs> identified with a with a story on whose behalf suffering is arising, and and really, I just use the miracle process of a course in miracles to look on the error without judgment, and and then by looking at the error, which is choosing separateness without judgment now non-judgmental presence is is there so I, I always teach people that once you have identified as separate and suffering is arising you're stuck there's no way out of that there's no way i as the separate self can sort of like bring my suffering to a close or bring my suffering to an end and so the course in miracle process is that you look on the problem the way it is rather than the way that you've set it up. And the problem, the way it is, is always that I've made a decision for the ego against the Holy Spirit. I've made a decision to be separate, to be a self made out of stories. And so the minute I look on the problem the way it is, with no judgment, there is non-judgmental awareness presence, and that's, that's the exit door from hell. Now, for the first time, there's a choice. I can I can be this self made out of stories on whose behalf suffering is arising, or I can fall back into this identity, which is non judgmental awareness, the truth of everything. And I guess that's my story and my process. So I forgot to say that if anyone has a question, you're very welcome to put it in the chat. And at some point, we'll stop and have a look at those. And later, there'll also be a chance to. Um, Put your hand up and ask Keith some questions. Um, but now, Keith, um, 
so you've come to a point now where um, you're pretty much very aware, I gather, that when these feelings of impatience or irritation arise, would you mind talking us through what sort of situations and how that might work in practice in, in the daily life of Keith um, yeah. as, as it's experienced now? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so I'll get up in the morning and there'll be thoughts. Um, and, and immediately I'm, I would say to myself, are those thoughts me or am I the awareness of those thoughts? And that, that puts me into the right mindset. Um, I, I could say that puts me into the right identity. It doesn't, it's not really an identity. It's more like a non-identity. Um, but it is what what would be called the capital S self, which is the truth of everything and everyone. Um, but it, but it feels almost more like it feels more like a non-self than it does a self per se. Um, and and then you know, albeit that I've had an awakening, um, it's not an abiding awakening, and so. You know, I'll be on the way to work and a cyclist will come off the cycle and onto the footpath and nearly run me over and and wrongness will come into my mind and get projected out onto the cyclist. This is wrong. And why would someone do this? And then the minute that happens, I just go, oh, I was insane. Um, and I just look at the problem, which is that I chose separateness and then the the pain of separateness, which is always waiting for us. So all the guilt of the original apparent separation from God, once we make a decision to identify as a separate self, a body with a story, the minute we do that, we plunge into guilt and self-hatred. And um, and so, you know, that then gets projected out onto the dream and whatever's going on in the dream. And it's like, you're the wrong one. You're the guilty one, you know. And so there's this flash of hatred um, that we have. And so and so really, the the instant that happens, I'll go, oh, I was insane. And then what I'll what I'll do is I'll look on the error without judgment, which is that I, I chose to be separate there. I chose to be a story. I chose to be a body there with a story. And. And then the minute I do, non-judgmental awareness is back in my mind. I know that's the truth. And I know it's the truth of everyone. So not only do I step out of separate identity for myself, but I know this is the truth of everyone, the cyclists and everyone else. Um, but but my entire day is pendulum swings. So there's no exalted guru here. <laughs> my entire day is pendulum swings. And I would say to people that... Um, you know, if you have an abiding awakening, so you just awaken to the truth of your identity and you're never tempted to identify as a story or a concept ever again, then you can burn A Course in Miracles. You can burn all the books because, like, you know, it's sorted, job done. Um, but A Course in Miracles is this beautiful, beautiful um, instruction manual um, on what to do to, first of all, awaken to this non-conceptual identity. It's the purpose of a workbook of A Course in Miracles with 365 lessons, um, training you how to get behind concepts and thoughts of what you are um, to the memory of God and Christ as one, which is the Holy Spirit. Um, and then A Course in Miracles is this perfect um, set of instructions on what you do with the pendulum swings. So it's not called A Course in the Miracle, or a miracle. It's called A Course in Miracles um, because, because of the pendulum swings, because the unresolved guilt in our mind is going to cause us to dissociate the non-judgmental awareness that is the truth of everything, uh, God's one holy innocent son, and rise as a separate self made out of stories on whose behalf suffering is now arising and the world is blamed for it. And A Course in Miracles is this beautiful set of instructions. You know, it's called, Jesus goes, let's call it the miracle, <laughs> all right? Here's what you do when you're trapped in separate identity and experiencing all the pain of separate identity. You use the miracle. You use the forgiveness process. Um, and, and, and it takes you back out of identification with thoughts. It brings you back out of identifying with an illusion of yourself that you've you've built up out of concepts and thoughts. And and again, the process of A Course in Miracles is quite simply that you look on the problem the way it is, 
which is separateness and the decision to be separate rather than the way you've set it up. Because the way we've set it up is that here I am, I was a happy ego in the world, everything was fabulous. And then you came along and you left the cycle track and you had no right to do that. And you caused this, you know, you did this to me. Look at this unpleasantness, look at this upset. So that's the problem, the way we've set it up. And Jesus is saying, you know, now you're being shown that you can escape and all that's required of you, all that's required of you is that you look on the problem the way it is rather than the way you've set it up. You have chosen to be separate. You fell into all the guilt and self-loathing that's there in separateness and you vomited it out onto the first person that had the slightest hint of blameability. You sent out the hungry dogs of fear to bring you back a victim that you can make a patsy for how awful your separateness is. And so the miracle is quite simply looking on the decision to be separate without judging yourself. Now, there's two. Who's the one that's looking at the decision to be separate with no judgment? Who's the one that's forgiving the decision for the ego? And that's our non-conceptual identity. Um, you know, consciousness, the Course teaches, is split. It's it's simultaneously wrong-minded and right-minded, but the two minds are dissociated. So you can identify as one or the other. It can't be neither and it can't be both. So at any given moment, I can identify as a separate self, a body with a story, um, an identity made out of concepts and thoughts. I can do that. Or at any given moment, I can, I can become right-minded. As Ken would say, I can become a non-judgmental observer of the wrong mind. Um, but but when I do return to right-mindedness, I, I can't be Keith and the observer of the... Because Keith is the wrong mind. That's just what I call my wrong mind. <laughs> um, I can't be Keith and I can't be right-minded at the same time. If... If I'm identified with Keith, I am identified as the thinker of the ego's thoughts and the feeler of the ego's feelings and the one the stories are about and the one that has control over his environment and that is separate. But if I return back to right-mindedness, then now I am simply an awareness of thoughts and feelings apparently happening. But they're not happening to anyone and they don't mean anything and they don't belong to anyone. It's just what's apparently happening. But but again, th there's no one there they're happening to because I've left the battleground. And to use our other metaphor, I have left the movie and I'm back in the, in the movie theater. So I can't be in the movie and the observer of the movie character at the same time. So that's the pendulum swings that I would do all throughout the day. And then that's that's the, that's the core of my teachings for people who are on this spiritual path to wake up. Keith, I think the, the uh, non-judgmental non looking, I think that's yeah. a difficult part for many of us. So looking at the ego without judgment, could yeah. you speak to that? How we, sometimes yeah. the judgment even hides so... Yeah. yeah, it's um, um. Th there's two important components to that. When you're trapped in separate identity, there is no way out. Okay, so when, when I'm identified as Keith, I can't go. Where's the Holy Spirit? Because the ego and the Holy Spirit can't connect with each other. Um, you know, I I can't say you know where is awareness? How, how do I Keith get back into awareness? Like it it. None of that happens, right? Um, you're stuck in ego identity. You're stuck as a self made out of stories and there's no exit. And so to exit this particular ego mind, you have to do something the ego can't do. And that there is nothing to ego. There is nothing to Anja or Keith other than resistance to the present moment. There is nothing. It's not that the ego seeks and resists. It's that there's nothing else to what an ego is other than a seeking and a resisting. A resisting of this moment, a rejection of it to want a better moment, to seek for happiness in the future, to seek that this moment be different, so that there is nothing to ego apart from that. Um, and, and so I, I, this is the hardest thing for me to teach people because... Um, 
no matter how many times I say it, everyone keeps falling into the same trap. Everyone, when they find themselves having an ego attack, will go, oh my God, this shouldn't be happening. I'm failing the course. I'm doing something wrong. This shouldn't be happening to me at this stage. How do I fix this? What's my forgiveness formula? How do I do it? What do I do? And none of that is useful, okay? Because again, what resists the ego is still ego. Okay. I, I, I would say it's like, you know, again, there are two minds. There's a wrong mind and a right mind. And, you know, in the wrong mind, there's this three ring circus, which is like thoughts and stories and feelings. And, um, and then when we do that, when we say, how do I fix this? How do I do my forgiveness formula? How do I, how, how do I undo the darkness? How do I get rid of this out of my mind? It's like we take on this persona of the ringmaster going, I'm going to put the circus under control. I've got to turn this into a holy circus. I've got to turn this into a good circus. I've got to, you know, um, tame the lions that are going on. But the ringmaster is still part of the circus. So you haven't left the closed system of ego. Because all seeking and resisting is of the ego. In, in the Course in Miracles, Jesus says um, the ego analyzes and the Holy Spirit accepts. Um, and so the only way out of hell is non resistance, non judgment. So right now, this, what is true, what is always here now, only from the perspective of illusions has got mixed up with thoughts and feelings and experiences and stories. Um, and so what, what has to happen is I have to separate out from the ego. I got to separate out from thoughts and feelings and concepts and stories. I've got to separate out from it. And the only way to separate out from it, the only way the exit door is going to open from the hell of separate identity and the pain of it is if I don't resist. I'm not sure who it was that says, to beat the devil, don't resist. Resist not evil. Um, and, and, and so the minute I allow the present moment to be what it is, the minute I drop all resistance to it, um, there is no ego presence anymore. So, so I can be, I can notice judgments that are happening in the circus, um, without judging myself for them. So the ego is nothing. I mean, it's just an idea. I mean, it doesn't even, it's not even real and it's shifting and it's, like the separate self, it's not even there all the time. It's, yeah. it's just this, it's this identity that's made out of stories and, and it's, it's completely unstable and it's changing all the time. And, and it makes up um, a self made out of stories for everyone else. And as they all interact, they're all changing and shifting and, and, and it's only ever an imaginary self made out of stories. Um, and so it's not there all the time. And this was the beautiful thing I realized about those moments when I was younger. And when I would have the, I would have said I felt God's presence in nature. Um, you know, A Course in Miracles teaches there's no cause in the world. So nothing in the world can cause you to feel peaceful or to feel unpeaceful. That's purely down to what you're doing with your mind. That's purely down to which teacher you've chosen, ego, separateness, or Holy Spirit, oneness. What is the truth of everything? And so what I learned then was that the times in nature when I felt that way, it was purely because this was what my ego thought was a beautiful natural scene. And, and in that moment, resistance to the present moment temporarily stopped there was an allowing of the present moment to be. And in those moments, there was no Keith. Again, there is nothing to your separate self-identity other than resistance to, to the present moment. And so in those moments, what's here now, our identity in the Holy Spirit, the truth of everything and everyone, that just shone in my mind. And I would have said, nature caused me to feel 
God's presence. Nature caused me to feel peace. It caused me to feel inspired. No, it didn't because there's no, the world is only an effect. It's not a cause. All that happened was in the cessation of seeking and resisting the innate qualities of what we are um, simply shone forwards in my mind. Um, so, so my 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 great search in my teens and my twenties for how do you, you know, because it was like chasing after a lover that kept disappearing. How how do I hold this? How 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 do I how do I keep this? And there was finally an answer, which is that any time there is an allowing of the present moment to be exactly what it is, any time there's a cessation of seeking and resisting. Anytime there's an allowing of the present moment to be, there's your presence of God and Christ as one, which the Holy Spirit is. So, so it's the hardest thing to teach people is that what you want to do is simply notice that you're making a decision to be a self made out of stories, a body with a story. You're just looking at that and you're forgiving it. You're, there's no judgment of it. You're just looking at it without comment, without um, opinion, without judgment. You're simply noting that there's a mistake getting made. And that's enough. You're not trying to fix it. You're not trying to change it. You're not trying to choose against it. You're not all of that. If you fight the darkness, you fuel the darkness. All you have to do is look at the problem the way it is rather than the way you're setting it up. And that's enough. That's enough because the minute you drop your resistance to the present moment and right now my decision to be a self made out of stories, that's part of the present moment. And the minute there is an allowing of the present moment to be, the minute there is no argument with what is, there's a softness arises in the mind. There's a peacefulness with the non-peace being there. It's a felt sense of being. You can't grasp it with your mind. It's not a concept. It's not, it's not a self made out of thoughts. It's just there is this softness, this felt sense of being um, that's known. Even, even with the, the pain and the upset of being an ego that's present, in, in, in the allowing of it to be, there is this presence arises which is the capital S self, which is the truth of everything and everyone. Um, and, and in time then, it wasn't something I did for a few, mo few months. I, just, I was just looking and going, but what does it have to do with me that's with Jesus? What does it have to do with my right mind? Um, but but after, after that practice, uh, practicing that diligently for so long, there was a point I wasn't even conscious of where, where I was automatically that and realized that there was never anyone there who suffered. There was only ever this. All the rest is just a story about no one. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 the most important thing I have learned in my journey and the one thing I would want everyone to know and to integrate into their spiritual practice is you must learn how to allow the present moment to be exactly what it is. Because in that moment, there is no separateness. Um, you know, that's, that's what will cause an awakening from the dream of the person. Because um, in those moments, there is no person. Everyone's had those moments in nature or holding their first baby for the first time or, you know, watching a moving everyone. So, you know, it, it's funny because on the spiritual path, everyone's going, oh, my God, I want an awakening. <laughs> I really want this. And my God, why is it not happening? And what people don't realize is, but you've had loads of moments in your life where you weren't there. All of the happiest, most joyous where there was genuine love, where there was inspiration present in your life, it's because you weren't there. 
there is nothing to your separate self-identity other than stories and thoughts and resistance to the present moment. When, when, when that's not there, when there's a, you know, a perfect moment, like, you know, holding a child and, and, and feeling that love, that's not your love as a person. That's God's love. That's the innate qualities of what you are in God that the Holy Spirit represents. And, and that love is blazing in your mind and it is the memory of God and Christ as one. And it's doing that because you're simply allowing a moment to be. Um, and that's the experience. So again, I would, I would really want people to understand that this is, Jesus says, you know, um, enlightenment is but a recognition, not a change at all. And that recognition starts with knowing that everyone has had these satori moments, these perfect moments. It could have been at someone's death. It could be at someone's birth. It could have been when your animal had kittens. It could have been reading a story about a cat that walked into a, a burning building and dragged her kittens out. And your mind just filled with love and, and the awareness and the realization that all is well in the world. There's, there's a goodness that is true. And that's, th those are all foretastes of awakening. And, and you've had them. And, and, and awakening is nothing more than that. And it is simply a stepping aside from an identity as a self made out of stories. got carried away there Angela how does that answer the question <laughs> it was really passionate yeah I love it I really your your uh forgiveness practice which is allowing the welcoming yeah. it really speaks to me it's really yeah yeah so it's well, really helpful the yeah. minute you do that the minute you welcome you allow you give up your resistance you know yes there's a decision decision to be separate otherwise suffering couldn't be present so there's a decision to identify with a story and the minute you just allow that to be the holy spirit has come it's the felt sense of being it's the peace with the non-peace being there and that's enough you know no one's ready in the beginning to let go of the self that they're looking at identification with the thoughts and stories that are going on but if you just learn to to look without judgment at the problem the way it is. Is there suffering? That's because there's identification as a separate. Can I just allow that to be there? Can I welcome it? Can I completely forgive it? Can I, can I offer no resistance to that which is part of the present moment? And that's the Holy Spirit. And you let that into your mind. You have opened the floodgates because that, that force, that presence will will carry you all the way to the real world uh sorry for that uh sounds like a bra bandwidth problem um, yeah i julie. think so yeah, yeah. maybe you you uh, shut your video off julie maybe that will help yeah i will in the meantime if you can hear me why don't you go ahead yes. and ask another question yeah. Um, um. <laughs> or, or if you can, can you hear me now? At the yeah, yeah, we can. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Keith, um, you, I was going to say how, you know, Ram Dass says that um, no matter how far you think you've come along the path or if you feel you've, you know, to what degree you're awakened, spend time with your family and it'll soon bring up um, triggers for you or show the unhealed parts of you. You've talked in your um, weekly sessions with your group about that happening, for example, with a family member. Would you mind sharing how that works in, in the classroom of life and how in your own life, how you've found, um, how you practice the forgiveness process and whatever you feel would be helpful to know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my mom is my greatest spiritual teacher. <laughs> um, my mom has a heart of gold. She would do anything for anyone, but she reserves the right to feel absolutely martyred and taken for granted about it afterwards. And um, you could tell her to do nothing, but everything you do is wrong. Um, and so it's a wonderful opportunity to practice, um, to practice forgiveness because, again, um, 
no one here is claiming to be an enlightened guru. I still dissociate uh, the truth of what we are to rise as a separate self on whose behalf a front arises when my mom sort of tells me I can't do anything right. Um, and 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 again, in that moment, it's just a pendulum um, shift. And and what's I, I think what's so important for people to understand, uh, and this is again, this is one of those things I just have to repeat over and over again, and everyone forgets, is that when that happens, that's not failing a course in miracles. That's not being a bad course student. Um, that is a necessary part of your path. You, you cannot undo the guilt in your mind until you have vomited it out onto someone. Um, and so the road to the real world, um, to a full and abiding awakening, um, th that road is paved with, with this dissociating of the truth of what you are to rise as a separate self and vomit the guilt that wouldn't allow you to stay identified as what's here now in this moment. Um, the guilt that wouldn't allow you to stay there, that made you afraid of the light and caused you to rise as a separate self and vomit guilt out onto the first person around you. That's why Jesus says, your brother is your savior. Not because of anything your brother does for you, but because you're going to vomit your guilt out onto your brother. And now that guilt that was unconscious, now that guilt that wouldn't let you stay in the light, now that's shining in your brother. And now you can take it back and go, that's my guilt of separateness. And, and, and then by looking at it without judgment and by joining your perception to the Holy Spirit, which means you're letting go of the ego's hand and separate identity hand, you're looking at the guilt of separateness for what it is without projection, without blaming someone else for it. And, and it will vanish as the illusion that it is. And that's how, that's that's the road home, people. It's not failure. That's what everyone thinks. This shouldn't be happening to me. I'm, I'm a course student. I've been doing this for 30 years. Why, do, why is this still happening? You know, in the course, Jesus says, anger is never justified. But he's not saying don't get angry. Of course you're going to get angry. Every time you identify as a self made out of stories, as an ego, you're going to be livid. It's livid with yourself and God, but it's going to get projected out onto everyone around you. So Jesus isn't saying don't get angry. He's saying when you get angry, don't justify it. Don't keep the projection in place. You know, don't buy the lie that says I'm angry because someone cut me off. I'm angry because someone spread rumors about me. I'm angry, you know, about this, that and the other. Jesus is going, don't, you know, anger's not justified. Yes, it's going to happen. And that's your opportunity to undo your guilt and undo your separateness. And so, again, that's one of those things that students just keep falling into a trap, a guilt trap. You know, the, the ego seeks to preserve itself in every way imaginable. So when you're following a spiritual path, the trap to fall into is that your spiritual practice makes you feel guilty. Well, our spiritual practice is about undoing guilt. It's about looking at the ego without judgment because, you know, we, because now we're learning to finally, finally laugh at the mad idea of separateness. No, into eternity, we're all as one. The crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. An idea of otherness, an idea of separateness. Um, and, and, you know, the whole course is about undoing that mistake, looking at the ego without judgment. That's uh, laughing, Keith. It's something I see you do a lot. And uh, I think it's one of the th things that helps me when I uh, watch the teacher so I mm -hmm. like teachers that laugh a lot. So uh, is it something that comes naturally to you or <laughs> how is yes, it? Yes, uh... it is. Yes, it is. Because um, the ego was serious. The ego is a serious business. You know, the ego, as far as the ego is concerned, it's, it, it's it, what it is. It's very being is sinful, guilty and evil. You know, that's, that, that's what we took on. You know, so... Um, so the, so once I identify as, as a separate self, that means if this is true, if I am a separate self, 
with these private thoughts and this body that walls me off from the world. And I have, I am this thing that has been born and will die and, and has agency and seeks control in life, all of which is nonsense. But the minute I say that's true, that means God was attacked. That's the origin of guilt. If I am, if I'm separate, if that's true, heaven was destroyed. Oneness was absolutely destroyed. So I could be this. Um, but but anytime we step out of the separate self identity, we, we we release a huge, a huge burden. Um, you know, the, the first the first couple of months after I had my awakening, I spent most of my time just crying. And if you ask me what's the emotion, I could just say to you, it was gratitude. It was this gratitude that I was wrong about everything. Thank God. And, you know. And and suffering's not real, and you know love is real, and and um yeah, it was just it, it was a gratitude. It was like being on your knees, screaming in gratitude, going, "Thank God, I was wrong about everything." Um, that dies down a little bit, and nobody should assume that's how you would experience an awakening because it's a very personal experience. It was that was just mine, and you must understand, I was coming from a place of hellish anxiety for 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 eight years, um. But, um, but yes, when, when I mean, because it really just boils down to me being aware of the beingness that's always here and knowing, because of course, you know, that there's many ways of, of, of awakening from the, the identity made out of thoughts, the, the conceptual identity, Jesus calls it the self-concept. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's a modern trend um, towards sort of neo Advaita. Now, let me say, Advaita Vedanta is is a very rich and um, full tradition in India, and 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 it's very structured in terms of how it's how it's administered and how it's studied. But but there's a modern neo Advaita, like which just like new Advaita, and 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 it really just sort of. Um, would be a Tony Parsons style of things, uh, where, whereby, you know, well, there's nobody there to be upset and there's, you know, who, who is there to be seeking and there is no seeker. And OK, so so there's that style of sort of self-inquiry. Um, but but it has to be said, it can go very, very wrong. Um, you know, there are lots of examples of people who who sort of like. um end up with this disconnectedness from their family, this inability to, to connect with them on an emotional level, this, this, this kind of like almost checked out and sort of, um, you know, that's where it can go really wrong in terms of an awakening. Um, and, and, and that can cause a lot of suffering for people. Um, and, and, and it can also sort of mean going into a period where, where you're sort of like generally checked out of life, where like there's no motivation and sort of no inclination to get involved in things. And, and of course, in miracles, it has this beautiful safety me mechanism that's built into it. Uh, what's gone wrong there is that there's a sort of a half awakening has happened. Um, and, uh, and within the half awakening, it's almost like instead of, you know, what I am, my brother is, and what my brother is, I am. There's a beautiful passage in the Course where Jesus says, uh, the Son has simply disappeared into the Father, and the Father has disappeared into the Son, which is, you know, this end of the, the journey, top of the ladder stuff. But, but again, that's what we do with our brothers in the sense that what's here now in this moment is the truth of everyone. But, but where it goes wrong, is where I, I form a new identity as the no self. I form a new identity as a me. And now I'm saying everyone is me, but that's not true. <laughs> um, and, and that's where it can go terribly, terribly wrong. And of course, in miracles has this beautiful process where Jesus says, you know, like you, your brother thinks he is a dream. He thinks he's a self made out of concepts and stories. So like you, your brother thinks he is a dream. Share not his illusion of himself because your identity depends on his reality. And so the way we practice the course then is that we, 
we return to what's here now in this moment, this awareness, and 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 we we extend the Holy Spirit. We see that as the truth of everyone. And so what's true of me is what is true of everyone. What is true purely of me is illusion. And what's true purely of you is illusion. And, and so really there is just this felt sense of being, which I hold and see as the truth of whoever I'm engaging with, knowing it's the truth of everyone. And, and if I hold that sense of being and I, I extend that sense of being and I see it everywhere, everything I do will have a lightness to it. Um, everything I do will have. It will be what love would do in the situation. And so that's that's what A Course in Miracles teaches. And it's it's just it's a beautiful safety mechanism that the ego doesn't hijack an awakening process and, you know, have this sort of like, you know, um, reclusive sort of like, you know, pseudo awakening, you know, um, just by extending the Holy Spirit by finding my identity and my innocence in my brothers. Um, it, it, it's just, it's a beautiful safety device that's built built into the whole process and, and, and makes for a healthy initial awakening. And then, of course, there's the restructuring and rewiring that has to happen after that. I yeah. might jump in here because there's a question in the chat from David Hempel about... Um, he said, knowing awakening is simply allowance of the present moment. What do you think abiding awakening, as you coined it, is? David, you, you can jump in if you feel to explain that more. I, I would say that, um, you know, uh, abiding awakenings happen, but they're incredibly rare by comparison. So what, what you have is you have an abiding awakening with Eckhart Tolle and with Byron Katie. Um, and, and the first thing needs to be said about that is that both of those awakenings were born out of years of intense suffering. That's the first thing to say. Um, and the second thing to say is that neither of them were really able to function in the world for a period of time after the awakening. Eckhart Tolle was homeless for two years. Um, Byron Katie was like a child that her family had to look after because she couldn't understand ownership and she couldn't understand other and they would be dragging her out of the neighbors' houses where the neighbors are going, This is our house. And she's like, What? <laughs> and she just couldn't understand ownership. Um, and so there there can be these sudden and abiding awakenings. Um, but but again, it you know, and lots of people are like, I want my awakening to be like that, but do you want to be homeless for two years? I mean, Eckhart was perfectly happy because <laughs> he knew he wasn't Eckhart. Um, but there was homelessness and not really able to look after himself. And the same thing with Byron Katie. So so these sudden kind of awakenings can, can bring their own problems. For the vast majority of people, um, an, a, an awakening takes place. And, you know, what I would say about an awakening, because there's going to be lots of foretastes. Like I would say all my times when I felt like, God's presence in nature. That those are four tastes of awakening. Um, but when you have an actual awakening, there's a fundamental shift in identity. Um, so what I would say to you is that even when I notice the suffering arises arising, because I've gone insane again and identified as a separate self, it 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 it, it, it would hurt me far too much to try and maintain that state. Um, the, the minute any kind of suffering arises, um, it, it's, it's on, it will be unfathomable for me now to like sulk for an hour over something. I, I couldn't do it. It will be too painful for me to do it because, because I, I, I'm aware of the absence of the peace that has become what I know is the truth, um, with no question or a doubt about that. So it's not to say that suffering and micro suffering won't arise, but the minute it does, I, I understand that's an insanity and I and I want to go back to the peace. So that's the kind of fundamental shift takes place w with an awakening. Um, but like I say, for the vast majority of us, a, an awakening is not going to be abiding. And 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 if that's so, of course, a miracles is perfect for you because a miracle is just you. You know, Jesus gives us a formula and he goes, listen, here's how you flip out of madness. 
you know, when you're stuck as a separate self and all the suffering of separateness is happening, here's this very simple formula and it allows you to flip your identity from a separate self back, back here, back into what is, back into the quiet center, the stately calm, the changeless dwelling place. Uh, back to what you always are in the present moment, this non-conceptual identity. Um, so that's what I would say, is that the vast majority of awakenings will tend to be much more like that. And uh, and the, the work then is just undoing the remaining guilt in your mind each time it causes you to dissociate the truth and rise as a separate self. I hope that makes sense as an answer. Yeah, maybe this is also a good moment for a little practice you would, because you were talking a lot about um, knowing who we are, the beingness. So maybe this is an opportunity to guide us into this or if you have yeah. other suggestions or. Yeah. So let's see. Um, so just for a few moments, we won't drag this out, but just for a few moments, close your eyes for a second. And you're not trying to control anything. Okay, let go of control. Instantly, thoughts are going to rush in, going, I don't know if I can do this. I'll probably do this. <laughs> and can you just allow them to be there? You just give them permission to be there. And you might become aware of how you're sitting, and there might be a moving of position. And can you allow that to be exactly what it is? Can you? offer no resistance to what's happening in the present moment. And just notice how thoughts are coming and going. Just notice how they're insane and circular and running in motions. And, and can you just let them be exactly what they are? And don't try to direct anything. If attention goes to the body, just allow that to happen. You know, and if a question arises that you want to ask, can you just allow it to be there? You just give everything permission to be exactly what it is. Any thoughts about what you have to do after the meeting, just, just give them permission to be there. And all the thoughts about, I don't know if I'm doing this right or not. I don't know if I'm really permitting it. Can you just give them permission to be there? Can you just forgive everything being exactly as it is? And any resistances to the present moment, can you allow them to be there? And I wonder if you can be aware of a softness, even as the mad thoughts jump around the place, even as the monkey brain flies from branch to branch. I wonder if you can be aware of a softness in the background. I wonder just if in allowing the present moment to be, you can feel an allowing that's always in your mind, an openness that's always there. And just allow whatever is happening. Is it permitted? All the thoughts all the movements, all the feelings, all the doubts, are they permitted? All the wondering, am I doing it right? Is that permitted to be there? Is that thought you? Or are you the one that's permitting it to be there? Is any thought you? Or are you the one that's hearing them?
Just open your eyes when you're ready. How'd you find that, Angie? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I don't find it. It's a great way of sinking back into the self. And yeah. I feel the, um, when a thought shows up, I feel some tension Hulk, on the yeah. forehead. And then when I sink back, I, there's a relaxation. So it was also that uh, pendulum, yeah. 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 So because because the, the the thoughts have hooks, you know, they're, they're they're trying to drag you into them and go identify with me, make a self out of stories. But and 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 the, the minute you fight them or resist them, you're lost to them. But the minute you allow them to be exactly what they are, you feel your freedom from all thoughts. Um. And and so. To me, this is the, the crucial thing to understand about miracles, forgiveness, of course, of miracles, um, you know, and to Ken's credit, you know, much criticized, but never equals. Ken got this and hammered this home as the message of A Course in Miracles. You know, he would say, it's not about choosing against your ego. It's not about fixing your ego. It's not about shouting down your ego. It's not about trying to be a holy ego. It's not about trying to be an ego, choosing the Holy Spirit. It's about looking at your ego with no judgment. And that's it. How right he is. You know, because lots of people go off on tangents going, I'm going to choose the Holy Spirit. And they're not. An ego can't choose the Holy Spirit. A separate self can't choose the Holy Spirit. It's nonsense. I'm not saying there's not a value to that for people, but this is not. Jesus is teaching you something much more profound than that. He's saying, if you look at the ego, if you genuinely permit it, permit it to be exactly what it is in the present moment, you experience what's there that's not an ego. It's just a felt sense of being. It doesn't even feel right to call it a self because we tend to associate self with the small s self. But, but it's like a non-identity. It's like a piece you can be instead of a self. And that is the capital S self. And and the key to it is looking at the ego without judging it. The key to it is looking at the fact that if you're suffering, you're choosing to be an ego and just allowing that decision, giving it permission to be there in this moment. And that's what connects you with the Holy Spirit in your mind, which is oneness, the memory of heaven's oneness. And that's the felt sense of being. Um, and, and the trick to it is learning to allow the present moment to be what it is, including a decision to be an ego. And, and if you do that, if you look at the ego without judgment, then th this identity that you are in the absence of the resisting of the ego this identity that you are is just in your mind. It's the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, lots of people talk about when they're going through difficult times of the course and the Holy Spirit's not available to them. And I, I give them the same prescription every time. You're not doing the one thing the miracle asks of you. You're not forgiving the situation exactly as it is right now. Because if you do that, the Holy Spirit is calm. Always. So... We don't save ourselves by judging ourselves um, and slapping ourselves around with A Course in Miracles. We save ourselves by looking at the decision to be an ego with no judgment because there is this presence takes over. Does that make sense? We've got about 20 minutes left, so we may open the floor for questions now. There are already two in the chat, and one of them was from Jan or Jan, and it was... Um, could you speak about the world as an illusion? I don't know if you're there. Um, is that Jan, if you want to um, unmute yourself and ask your question, or if Keith, you feel to speak to that? Sure. About the world um, as an illusion. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a crucial teaching in A Course in Miracles, um, is that, you know, Jesus says in the early lessons, I have invented the world I see. 
And because it's me that made it, he goes on and says, I am not a victim of the world I see. So if we're talking about the metaphysics of A Course in Miracles, you have the perfect oneness of heaven, which is a pure beingness. There is no I in heaven. I is consciousness. There is just pure beingness. Um, and into eternity, we're all as one. There crept a tiny mad idea of an I, another, something that could perceive itself in relation to beingness. So this is I am, the birth of I am. And, and then, you know, with this apparent separation, this consciousness, um, it splits into the ego and the Holy Spirit. And um, the ego is this thought of separateness, this thought of I. And the Holy Spirit is quite simply the memory of oneness. And the Holy Spirit does nothing. It's the part of your mind that just looks at appearances of separation and goes, but it can't be true. Um, because oneness is all that's real. Okay, so there's a decision for the ego, and now consciousness thinks it is an ego. It doesn't remember that there was a choice between oneness and separateness. It just believes it's an ego. And then there is this manufacturing of the idea of sin, guilt, and fear. Okay, so we, as this one consciousness, uh, we made up sin, guilt, and fear because we knew this separateness was a bit dodgy. It was a bit smoke and mirrorsy. Something chose this. They could choose against it. Um, and so as a decision against the mind's ability to choose, sin, guilt, and fear was made up. Um, if, I'm, if I really am an I, that does mean God was murdered, heaven was brought down, one, oneness was destroyed. It has to have been if I'm an I. Okay, it's not remembered because it didn't happen, but this is manufactured to bolster and strengthen the idea that separateness is real. Um, sin has happened. I feel awful guilt about it, and I'm terrified of God's retribution, sin, guilt, and fear. And, and then there's a defense needed against that, and so the mind splits again, splits into an innocent victim self and a sinful, guilty victimizer self. And, and again, once that's done, there's amnesia for the fact that I did this, and now there's just the belief that I'm an innocent victim self, and there is this sinful, guilty victimizer self that's coming after me, which I now think is God coming after me for to destroy the abomination I am as a separate thing in, in blasphemy of his oneness. Okay, so now there's a decision that says, I can't stay on the battleground of my mind. I, God's going to annihilate me, it's God. And so there's a decision which says, I got to get out of Dodge. And there's a decision made, which is make up a world, dream up a world, project it out, and then consciousness shatters itself like a mirror into gazillions of pieces and projects itself into all the figures in its dream to be mindless, to forget its mind so God can't get it in its mind. And so one consciousness shattered itself into gazillions of pieces. It projected itself um, into all the figures in its dream people, animals, flowers, plants, grains of sand, okay? And the minute it enters the body, it becomes mindless. The minute it becomes the figure in the dream, it forgets it's the dreamer. And so one mind is dreaming itself to be everyone and everything. And so in terms of the world being an illusion, the world is just what you consciousness look like to a body, a figure in the dream that you have programmed to see you consciousness as a world and bodies. And so really, as Jesus says, you know, what if you really knew this world was an hallucination? What if you knew you made it up? What if you knew all the people in it who are being born and suffering and killing each other and killing themselves and dying, what if you really knew they're wholly unreal? There is just one innocent, holy son of God standing behind all the images. And so the world is just what this one consciousness looks like from the perspective of a body that was programmed to see consciousness that way. 
That's why Jesus says, I thank you, Father, knowing you will come to close each little gap that lies between the broken pieces of your holy son. Your holiness, complete and perfect, lies in each one. I'm missing a line. <laughs> Going to go to where he says, how holy is the smallest grain of sand when it is recognized as part of the completed picture of God's holy son. Um, and so this is the oneness. This is the capital S South. There is no world. There is this one holy, innocent dreamer. Remember, consciousness from the perspective of the ego is damned. It's evil. It's holy. And unholy, I should say. And from the perspective of the Holy Spirit, it is one and it is still one with God. And so the knowledge and experience of oneness within the dream of duality is I am. So on the one hand, I am was the exit door from heaven. Um, however, it's also the exit door from hell and back into heaven um, is I am. It would be, it would be right-minded consciousness, um, which undoes wrong-minded consciousness. And then, you know, the right mind, its job done, it dissolves just like the wrong mind has dissolved. Consciousness dissolves and there's simply God is. There's just being this. Um, and so that's why the world is well, the world is an illusion. There is there is one dreamer who made the world, and that one dreamer projected itself into eight billion people, uh, not including animals and plants and flowers and everything else. But it projected itself into all the characters in its dream, from whose perspective the activity of consciousness looks like a world and bodies. Everything is still holiness. Um, everything is holy. You know, Jesus says, the forms, the broken pieces seem to take me nothing for the whole is in each one. And every aspect of the Son of God is just the same as every other part. So the forms, the broken pieces seem to take, Anja, Keith, Julie, mean nothing but the whole. The one mind, the one self behind the images behind the thoughts, behind the, the concepts, the whole is in each one. And every aspect of the Son of God is just the same as every other part. And that will be the basis of our holy relationship, whereby all relationships start off as special because you think your brother is different, different than other brothers and different than yourself. But Jesus is saying in the Course, I want to show you how to transform them into a holy relationship. Well, that is seeing the same holy mind as the truth of everyone and the forms the broken pieces seem to take me nothing they'll give you an idea of whether there is a calling out for love or an expression of love but that doesn't matter because it all is love in behind everything because once once you are joined with the holy spirit and right minded you claim that for everyone when when you're awake to the non-existence of separateness um you see the awakeness in everything and everyone. When you attack your identity to identify as an illusion of yourself, now you attack um, the mind, the one holy innocent mind, to see it as separate and special and different minds that are lacking and needing and wanting and suffering and unholy. Better get on with another question. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of other ones in the chat. I don't know if you want to combine them. There's about 10 minutes left. Um, one of the early ones was, could you discuss how to get to the present moment awareness in the workplace? And there's also, I find it very challenging to be in allowance or acceptance while experiencing illness or pain. Can you give us a process for dealing with these? Do you answer as you please okay and, and the answer is pretty much the same to both of them right so there's an idea in buddhism of the two spears so you know pain is almost an inevitability that's going to take place in life suffering is entirely optional so really what we're going to have is a situation where there is sensation taking place but unless i unless i claim that sensation as mine 
there is no evidence that it's mine. It's it's appearing in the field of awareness that you are. There's there's no evidence it's yours or, or belongs to you other than a thought which says it is. So sensation will be present, but but the one who suffers is an illusion. Um, Jesus says, what suffers is not part of me. What is in pain is but illusion in my mind. Um, and so, again, our, our trick is, is that we enter into... So listen, the first thing you do, because anything else is insanity, is when you have pain, you go to the doctor and you get all the magic that you can and all the potions and all the painkillers and you take the whole thing and you know you do the best you can to eliminate whatever suffering is present because anything else is madness. And then whatever is left, you surrender to it. You discover your invulnerability through surrender. Because... You know, the pain can be a blessing where you awaken from the dream of the one who suffers to this presence, which is the truth of you and everyone else, which doesn't suffer. Um, and you get to that through surrender. Because there's just a thought that says this shouldn't be happening. But where's your evidence that it shouldn't be happening? Where's the evidence that it's not the thing that's going to cause you to awaken from the dream of death? And it's the same in the workplace. How do you be in the present moment in the workplace? Stop resisting it. Or at least notice your resistances to what people are doing and how they're doing it and how much work you have to do. Just Could you just allow it all to be exactly as it is? And as you do that, you are the present moment. You know, that's what's here now. That's the capital S self. It is the present moment. Um, and, and, and you awaken to that by, by through surrender. And I don't mean that you're, you're giving in to a higher power or, you know, falling uh, against a stronger enemy. It's not that. It's that if you surrender to what is, you discover that the innate qualities of what you are in the present as the present moment is openness and a complete defenselessness against what are only illusions so with pain pain is you know pain, pain is a perceptual fact in the dream um but as jesus says you know nobody is angry at a fact the only thing anyone's ever angry at is a perception of a fact, an interpretation of a fact. What's the interpretation? It's happening to me. But who's the one it's happening to? That's just a story in your mind. Surrender, non-resistance, allowing it to be there. And all the thoughts that are resisting it to be there, can you allow them to be there? Can you just keep falling back into what's allowing? And that's where the Holy Spirit comes. That's where the peace comes. Um, more questions? You don't unmute again, Julie. <laughs> I was going to say anyone can unmute themselves and ask a question if they'd like to, um, or Anya, if you've got any more questions. I've got a very basic question. I feel I'm, it's probably not necessary to ask it, but I heard in the video, Keith, you said something along the lines of, when you ask, for example, you say to the Holy Spirit, show me how to see this. And there was some tweak that you put on that. And it, it stuck in my mind because I regularly say that in my mind. And you said, be careful that I think it's along the lines of not saying that as an ego. Yes. Um, so, you know, we... we so A Course in Miracles is, you know, it has a workbook that teaches you a completely different thought system. Um, and so we've covered that, is that I'm not a victim of the world. I see I made it up. I made up bodies. I consciousness. I made up bodies. I made them up so they would be innocent victims. So they would suffer as a result of forces outside of themselves. I did that. 
Why did I do that? So I consciousness could be pretend to be all the bodies in the dream um, and experience myself as an innocent victim instead of have the guilt of be the guilty victimizer of God. So I made up the world and I put vulnerable, pain-prone, aging, sickening bodies in the dream so I could pretend to be them and be an innocent victim, to be without my guilt, to not be the cause of my own misery by choosing separateness. I, I can see outside forces and go, you did this to me. I'm an innocent victim of my body. I'm an innocent victim of other bodies. I'm an innocent victim of the world. Okay, so you made up a dream and now you're pretending to be one of the characters in your dream and the character is suffering. Of course, the character is suffering. You wrote the dream that way. And so when we say to the Holy Spirit, show me a different way of looking at this, it's not that I stay the dream character, the self made out of stories, the body with, with a story and go, show me a different way to see this as a body. Show me a different way to see this as a separate self, because that's nonsense. The way I see this is I invented the world I see. I am not a victim of the world I see. Yes, the dream character I wrote is a victim of the world. That's the way I wrote it. But I don't have to identify as the dream character. That's the other way of looking at it. Um, and so it's not helpful to, you know, be sitting, you know, hating all your brothers at the kitchen table and go, show me the separate self, a different way of seeing this. At best, that's going to create forgiveness to destroy. You know, while I'm after being mugged on the street, show me a different way of looking at this. If I do that as a person, then I'm going to say, well, they were from a disadvantaged background. They didn't really have a good upbringing. I'm sure they have a drug addiction. That's the reason why they did it. And then I'm going to go, so I forgive them like a good ego, and that's forgiveness to destroy. I've made the sin real, and I've sought to excuse it. My brother is not innocent because his ego can be excused. My brother is innocent because he, the ego is not him. My, my, my brother is innocent because that's how God created him. There is one innocent dreamer behind all the dream figures. You know, it doesn't matter if it's Adolf Hitler or Mother Teresa. There is the same one holy innocent self that stands behind all of them. And so let me have another way of looking at it. it does not mean how do I keep do forgiveness to destroy and feel like a holy ego that's doing forgiveness and doing the course properly. That's nonsense. You know, this is a course in awakening. Um, and so I understand I made up Adolf Hitler and I made not me Keith. That's part of what was made up. I made up Keith. I made up Adolf Hitler. I made up Mother Teresa. You know, that's my dream. I did this, you know, to be a world God could enter not. And so I could see guilt outside of myself and say, there's the evil. It's not me. And I could be without my guilt. Um, and so how do I see this differently? You know, it's what's the truth of me? I'm choosing to be the dream character. Can I allow that? Can I welcome that? Can I allow that decision for separateness? And can I allow all the pain that's happening without blaming someone else for it? Can I undo projection? And can I feel what I am, which has always been innocent, which is not the insane voice talking to itself in my mind, which has no past or future? That's a dream. This is what's real, what's here now in this moment, this non-conceptual presence, this capital S self. And that's the truth of all the dream characters. If I stay Keith, then the one innocent dreamer is seen as multiple selves, guilty selves, holy selves, unholy selves, selves that shouldn't have done that. That's all nonsense. There is one holy dreamer standing behind all of them. And when you remember that it's what you are, that's what you see as the truth of everyone. And that's the different way of looking at it. It's not staying in ego and doing forgiveness to destroy, or you make sin real and then you try to forgive it. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
there's a there's a question from is it you'd like to unmute yourself and ask in the meantime it says wouldn't it also be necessary in addition to allowing the thoughts and sensations to be there at the moment to recognize them as totally illusory and part of this entire illusion that does not exist for forgiveness to happen yes but you're not going to do that as long as you are identified with a self made out of stories um it's going to feel very real um the only way you can have it feel less real is by you separating what you are out from the story from the self concept and it and that happens through non resistance of the present moment and that's by not resisting the feelings that are coming up by allowing by welcoming um by non resistance by non interference as you do that there is a felt sense of being rises now from there you can say to yourself are those thoughts me or am i the one that's hearing them are those feelings mine or am i the one that is the awareness of them being there now from that space you can feel that awareness can't be upset awareness has in vulnerability it, it it can misidentify with thoughts feelings and experience and think it can suffer um but but, but it can't because i am never actually becomes i am this or i am that you know i am shines always in the background of the dream of i am this and i am that the dreamer never actually becomes any of the characters in the dream and so in the allowing the welcome the non resistance i feel this this softness this this felt sense of being this this peace with whatever non peace is present um and this is the quiet center this is the stately calm this is the truth of you that cannot suffer you know when jesus says um what is in pain is but illusion in my mind what suffers isn't part of me what he's saying is no suffering of is part of what's here now the softness that arises the felt sense of being the non conceptual capital s self suffering has no reality here um so so we we look at the error without judgment and now john non-judgmental awareness is present now you have an alternative identity you know am i what i'm looking at or am i the one that's looking without judgment and once i shift my identity once i let go of the ego's hand i'm automatically this and from here all suffering is illusory all concepts are wrong all thought is wrong there is just this as the truth of everything so i hope that makes sense Keith will bring it up right there i uh, just thank you so much from all of us here and i'd also like to let people know actually anya perhaps can you share keith some details of I gather that you can't hear me at the moment, but I was going to say <laughs> that if anyone would like to support Keith or find out more about his teachings, it's acmwithkeith.com. It's it the is. website. Uh, Keith, would you I like know. to give out some of the details on how people can contact you and perhaps support you, make a donation? Um, sure. So you can, yes, the website is acimwithkeith.com. The podcast is A Course in Miracles with Keith. The um, YouTube channel is A Course in Miracles with Keith. And the Facebook group is A Course in Miracles with Keith. With the Facebook group, just please be sure to agree to the group rules or we won't let you in. So make sure you do that when you uh, apply for membership. And I would like to add that this uh, recording... Just thank you, everyone. That was... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, Julie, I would like to add that no, this go ahead, recording... Anya. Go ahead. <laughs> this recording will be uh, published on the YouTube channel of Awakening Together. So if 
And maybe we can post a link on your channel as well, Keith. I don't I'll know. I'll certainly is... I'll yeah, I'll certainly yeah. share a link as soon as you're up on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, Send me okay. an email to let me know when it's live. Great, yeah. So it was great to have you, Keith. Thank you very much. And this is awakening together. Yes, thank you. And um, for everyone listening, if you're new to Awakening Together, we've got lots of fantastic free resources. And so the website is awakening-together.org. And um, we've got a discussion tomorrow scheduled of this that song, and everyone is welcome to come to that as well. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Keith, especially. Pleasure, pleasure. Okay, bye, All right, well, I'll hand over. Do we hand? I don't know. I think I'll take it back from here, ladies. Okay. Thank okay. you. Great. Thank you. Keith, you. thank you for a beautiful satsang. Is oh, thank you. With you all. Really, really gorgeous. Tremendous clarity. Thank you for taking the extra time to answer all those questions. We look forward no to problem. the recording with you. And we look forward to joining with you again. Are there any announcements you want to make about upcoming events or anything? Uh, for me? Um I'll be doing the Foundation for Inner Peace webinar on Thursday. So you can register that if you want. We're going to talk about specialness as a substitution for love, which would be very much so along the lines of where we went today in terms of, you know, what you think about yourself that's different or special and what you think about your brother that's different or special is the illusion and the truth that you see in your brother is how you find the truth of what, what, what you are yourself. So we'll have that discussion in the Foundation on Thursday. Fabulous. Thank you again all for joining us. We will be back here live in the sanctuary for anyone who wishes to join us again at 5 p.m. Eastern time, 10 o'clock in Dublin. Uh, and anytime you feel called, we are here. We are awakening together and we would love to have you join us right here in this Zoom sanctuary. Thank you again and have a wonderful evening. Thank you for watching our satsang. We hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to join us live, please remember you can do so by visiting our website at awakening-together.org. We'd love to see you in the sanctuary. Again, our website is awakening-together.org. Remember to click the bell for more notifications and subscribe.